Hello, and welcome to the session on creating DevOps workspaces in Teams. In this session, we are going to talk about how to set up Teams to get the most out of it as a software engineering organization. Here's a quick intro about myself. I am one of the founding members of Teams. So for those of you who know the story, yes, I was in Vegas when we hatched the plan for this. So that means I've been with this group since the very beginning, and that has really given me an opportunity to see uh, what works when you're using Teams as an organization and how to get the most out of it. And I want to share some of those things with you today. Here's the high-level list of topics that we're going to be talking about. We'll start by understanding how Teams fits into all the other collaboration apps that Microsoft has. Then we'll get into Teams and channels and how to think about them. And then I'll talk about how to do all the things you do while building software. How do you do all those discussions and collaboration inside Teams? Um, then I'll talk about custom processes. In my experience, every team that's managing bugs or incidents tends to do some things a little bit differently. So I'll talk about how you can bring those discussions into your teams and collaborate. Um, and then uh, I'll get into a very important topic, which is when you are bringing a bunch of people together to work on something, you want to make sure they're having fun. And we have a bunch of apps in our store that can help you do that. So let's move on. So first thing, how do you think about teams? So I think a very good way to look at the products we have is to look at it this way. So think about scenarios where uh, you want to collaborate with people, but your audience is not predetermined. So think about a website you need to create for external customers or a website you need to create for your project, for people inside your organization, or you want to have a discussion with people in your company with whoever wants to participate in it. Or think about a video you want to share. So these things are outer loop sort of communication collab scenarios, and these are very well handled by SharePoint, Yammer, and Stream. So now think about scenarios where you need to reach someone in another company. You don't know what software they're using, and so email works great for that. So Outlook is great for this ubiquitous formal sort of communication that has to work regardless of what the other person is using. Teams is great for your inner loop, and this is what I mean by the inner loop. So think about all the things you do while building software, starting from planning, then you're writing code, and then you're having discussions around builds, and sometimes they're broken. Then you're discussing tests, and again, tests might be broken. You're talking about releases, and then you get into ops side of things, which is around deployment, operating, and monitoring. So you do a bunch of discussions on all of these things, and you can do all of them inside Teams, and I'll show you how. So this is the first thing. So now that we're getting into Teams, the first thing you need to understand is how are Teams and channels different? So Team, very simply, is when you bring a bunch of people together to work on something, is you know that thing is a team. This thing could be a project that you're working on or some common interest like hiking and biking. So you create a team for that. And then within this team, you have workspaces and you model these workspaces using channels. So we have two types of channels today. We have standard channels and private channels. Standard channels inherit all their membership from the parent team, so everybody in the team can access them. Whereas you can have private channels as well where you can only restrict them to a subset of people. So for the most part, you want to use standard channels, but private channels are great if you want to have like some channels for managers where they want to discuss stuff which might be randomizing for people uh, that don't have full context. So stay in standard channels. Um, so now this is why channels are awesome. In an inbox oriented world, everything comes to your inbox and then you have to invest the time and the effort to create rules to sort things into folders. By using channels and these topics, people are doing it for you. So this is one of the things where by just by using Teams, the information and collaboration is much better managed. So now your question might be, all right, so I created these channels, stuff is happening in a bunch of different places. How do I stay on top of it? Here are four main ideas. So the first thing you should do is you should set up your channel notification settings so that you get a notification for channels where stuff is happening that you work on. So I'll give an example. I work on bot support in Teams. So I've set up my notification settings for the bots channel so that for every new message and reply, I get a notification. I want that because I work on bots. But now think about file support in Teams, which I care about, but I don't work on. So to read about what's happening in files, I rely on the bolding behavior inside Teams. So I would go to the files channel and read when I have time. So not overwhelmed. So now what about things where you are not getting notifications for or you didn't even see it uh, through bolding? How do you find that stuff? Search is great for that. So here's an example. So let's say an incident happened and you want to see where was this incident discussed. You can just go to search and type the incident ID and Teams will take you to the discussion. So you can then, you, know, you don't have to be CC'd on you know, all the emails and then your old and then stuff. With Teams, it's all there and you can find it when you need it. And so now when you find stuff and you, want, you think you might want to get back to it easily later, you can just save messages. So four big ideas helps you stay on top of information, all the stuff that's happening in Teams. So with the basics out of the way, now let's think about how do you set up these channels? And I'll give you examples of the channels that software engineering team might have. But before we get there, 
let's think about how can you bring context into these channels by using apps. So this is the power of apps. So for tabs, think about them as like displays you might have in like a common workspace for your team. So the displays will probably be showing dashboards, would be showing your important information for your team. Uh, there might be posters, you know, so things like that, you can model them in your virtual world by using tabs. So Teams, by default, every channel has two tabs. We have posts and files, but you can create a bunch more custom tabs by using the tabs we have in our store. Um, so if, let's say, you want to bring information from some system that is not integrated into Teams yet, I wanted to call out that you can just use the website tab. So no excuse. You can easily bring stuff into Teams by using tabs. So now you've talked about these displays on the wall, but now think about how cool would it be if you could have like a digital assistant type thing as well, where you can just command a system to do something from inside Teams. So you can do that with bots. So with bots, you can send a message in a channel and you can ask a bot to do something. So I'll give an example. So think about an outage happens and you want to run a query to figure out the number of users impacted. So it's, it's a common thing you want to do for each incident and you can automate that using a bot. So an incident happens, you can send a message to the bot through the channel, bot runs the query, comes back. So middle of the night, you don't have to think about how to write this query. You don't have to open another tab to find this query to run. The bot, you just send a command and it does it for you. So bots, can you can use them to command stuff. And bots, you can also use them to search for stuff without leaving teams. So that's another great thing you can do. So want to look up a bug, send a message to bot, comes back with the information about the bug. So one very important thing, and you know that's one of the powerful things with bots, is they can proactively post stuff into channels. So this is great for scenarios like outages, or you know some system is running hot. So the bot can actually post into the channel saying, you know, this thing looks bad, and then your team can jump in and sort it out. So, so, so far we talked about Teams, how to think about Microsoft Teams among all the apps we have, and how to think about Teams and channels and how to bring context and apps. So with this sort of ideas, now let's map them to what happens inside software engineering. So here are some sort of standard channels you might have in a team. So you would have a general channel where you discuss things like announcements, business reviews. Um, you might have an initiation channel, planning, um, execution, and monitoring. In the initiation channel, you're probably talking about feasibility studies of projects that are about to be kicked off, uh, scoping discussions. In the planning channel, you're looking at your dashboards, you're looking at for um, your plans or reviews, your budgets and risks and stuff like that. In the execution channel, that's where your sprint planning is happening, your standup is happening, your retrospectives are happening. And then you might have um, a channel on monitoring where you talk about bugs or user experience issues that people are reporting and performance. The boxes in black there are the kind of apps you might have. In the next slide, I'll give you an even um, more clearer example. So this is a team where you have the architecture channel. So now think back to the thing I mentioned about notifications, right? So this is why this works. In the architecture channel, everybody in your team knows that when a new thing is about to be built, we have all decided that we will post about it in the architecture channel. So this allows your team to stay on top of what's coming. So if let's say um, a person A is working on something and that might impact me in some way, I know that you know they're going to post about that in the architecture channel and I can read uh, what they're planning to do and evaluate how that impacts me. So this is why um, having these channels helps. So these are the apps you might use. So in the architecture review, I think you would use a Word document for your spec. Um, of course, you're free to use uh, other apps as well. Uh, you might use OneNote for, to organize the meetings you might have had in Node architecture reviews. In the quarterly planning channel, so now you want context around stuff that should be built in the next quarter, stuff people are asking for. So the things, the apps you might use there is Power BI tab to have, you know, look at the signals you have available. You might have a uh, GitHub board to show all the issues that have been reported. You might use user voice to look at the things people are asking for. Uh, you might use Jira, OneNote Planner, and Azure Board. So things that matter for planning are all there in the planning channel for you. You don't have to have 100 different tabs open. That's the power of this. Um, so now when stuff has been built, you can have a pull request channel, and you can set up connectors so that they post into the channel when a new pull request is created. And I'll show an example of you know what's the benefit of doing it. So again, the big thing is context switching, but I'll make it more real. So with pull requests, um, we have Azure repos that you can set up to post into the channel when a new pull request is created. You can set up GitHub to post into the channel for the same thing, Azure DevOps as well. So but the idea is you know, anything your team know, needs is there in Teams for you. Um, Shiproom channel, this is where you're thinking about stuff that is in the pipeline, you know, it's being worked on. So you have dashboards to look at the bugs, look at the status of things, 
um, uh, so these dashboards could be by Power BI or Azure Boards or Jira, you know, whatever you happen to use. You might use OneNote again to organize your shiproom meetings. So, and then you know, stuff is built and now it's being deployed. So you can have a build and release channel where you can set up apps to post into the channel and a new build is happening. So you have one place to go to figure out what's happening with this build, right? So you can set up Azure pipelines um, and you can set up um, Jenkins as well. So hopefully this gives you ideas. You know, all of this works because of the notification stuff I mentioned earlier and you're working in the open so you can find stuff when you need it. So here's an example of the benefits of piping stuff into Teams. So in this case, um, there's a pull request channel and Azure DevOps posted into the channel when a new pull request was created. So all of us are in Teams. All your team is in Teams, right? So uh, the developer can just tag the people that he wants, uh, he or she wants to look at the pull request and then you can have that discussion inside Teams. So people in the future that join your team, they know that if they use search, they'll be able to find this discussion. So, so this is great. Um, and I'll map this sort of things to like outages and stuff like that in the slides that are coming up. So you want to set up your apps for context and then you have these discussions happening and those are some of the benefits. So now let's get into the things you do while building software and how can you do them inside Teams. So let's start with Scrum. So Teams has audio video calling capabilities built in which means you can do your Scrum inside Teams itself, right? So you can go in the channel, start your Scrum. People can see that there's a Scrum happening and they can just click on a button and join your Scrum. During the Scrum, you can look at the tab and you can update your board as people give updates, right? So it's, it's great, it's all there. Um, your PMs, your designers, if they're interested, they can jump right in and find out what's happening. So I wanted to call out some apps, so, um, with the Teams approach I mentioned earlier, you can do a Scrum, but people need to attend it. Uh, but we have uh, some bots as well that I wanted to call out. So we have Scrum Genius and Agile Poly, both of them are awesome. And what these bots do is they will reach out to your team and get their status and then aggregate and summarize and post into the channel. So people don't need to attend the Scrum if they're not able to. Um, if let's say you do Scrum a bit differently or you're just interested in having your own bot do this, we have a Scrum bot app template. So it's open source available on GitHub and you can take it and deploy it in your own Azure subscription and you can do scrums that way. Um, so the link is right there, aka.ms app templates and I'll share this link again. So bots in store and then you can do custom uh, bot yourself as well. So this is another example of things piping into channels and the benefits of it. So this is a real example from our own team. Uh, we have public GitHub repos. So we have set it up so that whenever a new issue is logged, we get a post in a channel through the GitHub connector and then we can uh, discuss um, how to respond to the issue uh, within the channel itself and then one of us can go and respond. So it, we basically we can collaborate on stuff happening outside Teams, within Teams and then figure out how to tackle it. So great benefit. Uh, here are some more examples. So now you're thinking about builds and with builds, you're a bunch of people working on it. Um, build is broken or not going out and you want to find out what's happening. The, so the benefit here is you can have a release notifications channel where you can set up Azure pipelines and Azure uh, DevOps, and they can post into the channel when a new build or release is happening, so that if it is blocked, uh, you know where to go to find out what's happening and participate in the discussion. So you can do this inside Teams as well. So talked about pull requests, talked about builds, and then one of my favorite things um, to do inside Teams, uh, this is where I think Teams shines, is uh, outage note discussion. So uh, I have an example here from PagerDuty. And uh, so PagerDuty Ops Genie are available in the store and you can set up your incident discussions this way. So in this example, you know, there's an outage where tax calculations are broken uh, in your shopping cart and you know, PagerDuty can uh, post into the channel about the outage and then somebody can, um, your on-call can jump on it or whoever is available can jump on it and take a look at the issue. Um, and so th this is where I said team shines because, um, because of the reply chain behavior for leaders in your organization or other people, they can just scroll up and uh, they can see each discussion separately. So that's where our UX plus this stuff coming into Teams you know, works really well together. So talked about outages as well, and you know, this is, uh, I think this is great as well. So now let's get into custom processes and how do you manage bugs, um, and I'll show uh, how we do it as well. So for this, think about scenarios where um, you have a system that was built a while back, let's say, um, or it was built recently, but it does not have a uh, app inside Teams that you can set up. So uh, you can bring information from that system into Teams by using an incoming webhook. So incoming webhooks are super easy to use. All you need to do and uh, know how to do is how to make an HTTP post to an endpoint. And then in this JSON uh, structure that's um, documented online, 
and so you can have this nice card show up. So um, very easy to integrate external systems. And I mentioned the website tab earlier as well. So incoming webhooks will post into the messages. They'll basically create messages, and then the uh, website tab is your tab. So incoming webhooks, super easy. If you want more power, uh, Power Automate and Flow are great. Um, so here's an example. So at the end of our on-call rotation inside Teams, uh, so on Friday, we had this need where we wanted to look at the incidents that happened, how many Sev1, Sev2, Sev3s, Sev4s, and so on. So we automated that using Flow. So it connects to our internal database for incidents and summarizes and posts. So you can do the same thing. So you can have flows that run based on time, or you can have flows that run based on something happening in another system. And you know this thing could be a new blog post or a new bug being logged and you want some side effects to happen. As a result of them, you can do that using Flow. With Flow, you can also do stuff in outside systems based on things happening inside Teams. So Flow has triggers for a new message being posted on a team or a new um, person joining the team. So you can update these external systems from within Teams uh, by setting up these uh, flows as well. So no-code approach gives you more power than incoming webhook. But if you really want the most flexibility, what you should do is build a custom bot. So you can use a, uh, you can build a bot using bot framework, and we support that for Teams. And here's an example of what we have done inside our organization. So in our organization, we manage some bugs by using marking them as release blockers. And these are bugs that are so, so bad that we blocked the whole release for them. And our need was we wanted one place to discuss these issues. So we automated that using this bot called Arnold. So it's basically looking at our Azure DevOps, and then when it detects a bug that has been marked as a release blocker, it starts a discussion in the channel and at mentions the relevant people. So it at mentions the developer the bug is assigned to, their program manager, their dev manager, um, maybe the on-call. And so they can come and figure out how to take care of this bug quickly. And the benefit, again, is other people in the organization that are you know, maybe they don't even have this bug assigned to them, but they know where to go to find out what's happening with the release, why is it blocked. So that is why you know this works great. And this bot can keep updating the parent message based on the current status. So you can just stay inside Teams and you know what's happening. So I gave you a bunch of ideas around custom apps as well. And I talked earlier about how to use some of the apps available in store to bring context. So now let's get into how do you really um, have a cultural transformation inside Teams where um, people are are working together and they're having fun. And when that when that happens, and from your own experience, you would have seen, like, you know, that's when um, you know great things happen. And I'll give you some examples of apps you can use to do that. So we have praise in our store, and I'll anchor that in a story. So let's say an outage happens at like 5:36 p.m. when people were trying to leave work, and then you have a few people who stay back to fix the issue. So you want to thank them, right? And um, you can use Praise to do that. So Praise ships with these bunch of stickers out of box, and you can Sorry, I think I lost you there. So you can use praise to thank people in your organization in a public fashion. So, um, so next, let's talk about um, Icebreaker. And so what this bot can do is it's an app template, so you can take it from GitHub and deploy it on your own. And uh, what Icebreaker does is every week, it would pair people at, up at random for lunch, coffee, or an online meeting. And the idea really is that you know this is an opportunity for people to connect with each other and understand you know, why they're working on what they're working on, uh, what do they want to achieve, so that when you're then having these discussions around design, um, you have just more empathy for each other's positions. So Icebreaker is great for that, and we use it in our organization as well. So um, talked about um, Icebreaker and Praise, and there are, here are some ideas for how you can just have a more sort of fun, lighthearted um, you know, conversations. So we have Giphy stickers and memes, and again, with Giphy, the idea is that instead of just saying textually thank you or uh, awesome, you can use a GIF and it's just more dimensional and has more impact. Um, you can use stickers as well and you can use memes. So again, these things can help you just have a more lighthearted sort of environment in your team. And so folks are having fun working together. So we have a lot of open source app templates available and we have more than a dozen of them at this point and we're adding more all the time. This is the link aka.ms slash app templates. And here's the main takeaway I want you to have. When you're using Teams for DevOps collaboration, not only will you be more productive, 
but all the apps that I mentioned can also bring about a culture transformation around transparency and people just enjoying working together better. So these two ingredients, I believe, have been one of the you know key things for our success as well, and that's why I'm sharing all of this here. So I hope all of this is you know got you excited and you're like, okay, how do we adopt this in our own org? And here are some ideas. So you can start small. Um, so you can do all your collab inside teams for a new team that is starting off or you can do all of this inside teams for a new project within the team, or if the project has been also going on for a while, you can use teams for a process or a function. So start somewhere, start small. Um, then build the habit. So um, think about whenever you're having a discussion, could this be inside teams? And you can use status messages or automatic replies to encourage people to find you in teams. So build the habit. And then when you're, you know, the habit is starting to build, you can just you know get more people to buy in by creating new traditions in teams. So you can do your promotion celebrations inside teams, virtual lunches, uh, and I mentioned icebreaker as well, and you know coworker appreciation. So do these fun things inside teams, and you know, once your organization has like adopted this a bit more, then think about doing a hackathon to build some custom apps for the needs of your own organization. So with these things, I you know I, I think you'll be successful with teams, and you know uh, uh, you know I think I've been I really love teams for all the things it's allowed us to do. So here's the survey I would encourage all of you to take so that we can understand your DevOps needs better. It's aka.ms slash teams DevOps survey. And now I'll welcome my colleague Erin for the questions. Erin, what questions do we have? Hi, Sid. Um, oh, we have a little bit of an echo. Great. Um, we had our first question. When will adaptive cards be supported for incoming webhooks in Teams? Yeah, so great news on that. Um, we are announcing at Build this year that we will support adaptive cards inside Teams and it will roll out by June. Oh, that's fantastic. So adaptive cards inside webhooks, you'd be able to use them, yes. And we had, a, we had a, a similar question. Can you tell us more about integrating adaptive cards in Teams? So um, so adaptive cards, you can, uh, so it's basically JSON. I'm not sure how familiar the person is with adaptive cards, but basically it's a JSON structure where you say this is where a text block is, this is where an input element is and team turns that into a nice card. Um, so you can post these cards today using bots. Um, so you know, the examples I showed for the um, GitHub connector earlier, they're all cards. Um, so you can post cards like that from your bot or you can use a webhook as well. Just post to a URL and you'll have a card like that in Teams. So it's really easy to do. And um, go look at adaptivecards.io and your, you know, if you do searches, you should be able to find samples easily as well. Great. Um, a question came up while you were talking about outage and release blocker bots. Um, are these bots applied at a channel level or at they are, an, at, are they at an organizational level? So you want them at the channel level. So now I'm wondering why would you ask at the organization level? But um, so, I mean, typically you your team maintains a service, right? And for things that are broken in the service, you are setting up these bots so that your team knows about them. So for the most part, it makes sense to create a channel inside that team and set up one of these bots so they can post in that channel. So for the most part, it makes sense at the channel level, but um, there might be scenarios like definitely inside Microsoft where there are some services that are so core that when they're broken, they break a bunch of stuff across the board. Like so think about Azure storage, for example. So in that case, we might you know go a bit more fancy and spin up a team and add a bunch of teams that, uh, programmatically. Um, but I'm not sure how common that scenario would be, but that's also a possibility. So you can create a team using graph APIs. You can add people using graph APIs, and so you can automate that, all of that for outages as well. Awesome. Are private channels hidden by default, or is it possible to see a channel, um, that a channel exists even if you can't join it? And the person asks because they don't want members to feel left out if they can see a channel but not join it. Right, so um, no, you cannot see that a private channel exists. And uh, if you're asking that question, you should you know, really see if, um, you should basically do stuff in the open, right? So be very, very careful. Um, your private channel should really be your last resort because once you're doing it, you're back to the email world because you are not knowing about stuff happening because you're not in the private channel. So really the benefits of Teams is if you do stuff in public channels. But of course, you know we support private channels as well. That's good advice. If discussions on issues happen within Teams, uh, would this discussion become disconnected from the issue in GitHub? So it, it is by design um, where in the in the discussion, the channel, you're figuring out how to respond and then you can go and respond in the GitHub. So there is a separation, but at the same time, you can set it up. So um, GitHub app today doesn't sync discussions, but you could do it using Flow. So you can have a Flow trigger that can catch a new reply posted 
and then you can set it up so that it goes and updates the GitHub post as well. So if you wanted, you can do it, but by default, the GitHub app doesn't do it. Okay. Um, this question is about um, CI/CD integrations. Does Teams uh, support notifications for other CI/CD integrations other than Azure? Yes, so we have Jenkins, um, but we have webhooks, like I said. So if there is something that you're using that's not in our store, you could see if webhooks works for you. Um, if not, you can, you know, again, use Flow. Um, Flow can, you know, pick up stuff from other channel connectors and post into Teams, or your last resort would be to build a custom bot as well. So um, I, I don't remember all the uh, apps for uh, builds off the top of my head. So we, I would look at the apps in our Teams. So you have this icon right there and see if you can find it. But if not, you can just create um, a webhook or a Flow or a custom bot. Awesome. How do you handle discussions in a Teams channel that require looping in people from outside of that specific team? Yeah, so great question. So this happens with outages a lot where your team depends on something that is owned by another team. And um, so you've started the discussion in your current team and how do you bring people in? So um, so it, what we have today is you can you know tag the owners and say, hey, can you please add this person? Or any member can actually go to the members uh, form in the team and request a person to be added and the owners will get a notification and they can approve it. So it's it's a bit manual right now, um, but the support is definitely there. So as a person who's not the owner, you can request the owners um, through the members UI um, to add someone else as well. Um, here's a question about the serv a service now and Teams. Do we have an integration with service now for Teams today? We do have a service now integration in Teams and there's some um, new stuff coming down the road as well. Exciting. Uh, what do you rec recommend for storing documentation or blueprints? Uh, and the person suggested SharePoint repos or something else. So um, you can do it inside the files um, tab that the channel has. Um, so that works great, but let's say they are stored somewhere else for some reason and you still want to bring that context into Teams. So you have a couple of options. You, uh, the SharePoint tab in Teams does allow you to point it to a different SharePoint site. So that you could look into that, or you can always just create a website tab and point it to wherever you have your documents. Okay, thank you. Uh, we use Microsoft Teams regularly. How do you recommend building discipline amongst your team to use it and to follow the suggested channel topics? Yeah, so great question. Um, so I, so lots of aspects there, but I think you know one thing is your leaders have to encourage your you know folks to use Teams more. And um, think about having the right set of channels. You know that might be part of the problem where because the right channels don't exist, people are just going to general channel and just discussing everything there. Um, you can also have you know flow set up. You know maybe you can nag people or don't discuss it here. Go here. You know you can maybe look for keywords or stuff like that. Um, so um, shared a bunch of ideas here, but it's really about educating your team and having the right set of channels that you know so that they are not they should be able to figure out where the discussion should happen. And of course, right, they have to follow it. You cannot uh, really force it. Um, maybe you can use praise to encourage people to do the right thing. Great, I think this is gonna be our last question, Sid. Can bots receive messages without being explicitly tagged or mentioned? Yeah, so this has come up for a while and this is possible now using Flow. So actually there are two ways to do it. You can do it using Flow where you can set up a Flow that watches for new messages in a channel and then it calls an HTTP endpoint and that HTTP endpoint could be a way to poke your bot to do something and respond. So that's one way, it's pretty straightforward. The other way is you can actually use graph webhook notifications where you can subscribe to new messages in a channel inside your bot and then the bot can post. So that's a bit more coding. Uh, the, the flow one is super straightforward to set up. Great, and that's it for our questions, Sid. I wanted to jump in with one more thing. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like to follow up with our team uh, about, uh, you can reach us at Microsoft Teams Dev at Microsoft.com. It's an email um, that goes to us. Thanks, Erin. Thank you, everyone, for watching our session, and I hope this was useful. Um, please reach out, as Erin said. Thank you.